You are now entering the spoiler zone. The following podcast contains explicit plot details and pockets of profanity. You have been warned. The Exton Moss Experiment. Adventures in wine and space with Simon Exton and Ken Moss. Hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to another edition of the Exton Moss Experiment. I'm Ken Moss. I'm Simon Exton. And tonight, it's the long-awaited second volume of Children's TV. Woohoo! We are going to be watching little ten-minute snippets of Children's TV, and various other people are going to be commenting on their little favourites for this episode. Before we do that... We need a little drinky. It's time to get out the tonic screwdriver and wave the wand in the general direction of the gin. Tonight we are drinking Rick, Rickfield Mediterranean Dry Gin. Oh, we could have found a better titled one for a children's TV episode. Yes, really couldn't. My name is Rick Feel. Uh, the Infobolics is absent. It's 41%. It's, it's from Austria. Distilled and bottled by Rick Spirit in Vienna, Austria. Uh, and it just lists the botanicals, which are juniper, licorice root, orange, orange blossom, lemon, pepper, cardamom, olive, coriander, rosemary, without the E, thyme, and basil. Well, Dr. Exton, first things first, nasal appraisal, please. Mm. Lots and lots. Vaguely minty, like a tree bore extra strong mint. I was going to say nettly, but n- nettly is quite minty anyway. Mm, yeah, yeah it, it's sort of herbal. Eyes down, dive in. How does Rick feel? Not bad, actually. God, this is about children's television. It's going to be cancelled. The name is Rick Feel, presenter of children's television. Stop, 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 stop. stop. Here's my finger, here's my mouse. Let's put them together and see what comes out of it. Oh, it's so wrong. (laughs) Anyway, Rick Rick Field's dry gin. How does does it feel? Oh, like an (gasps) impending arrest. Uh, (laughs) It's quite herbal. It is quite herbal, it is. It's quite herbal. It's not OTT herbal, um... It's smooth, it's nice to blend it, there's no nasty bitter aftertaste, it very definitely tastes like a gin. It's just a bit unremarkable. There's a little prickle on the tongue afterwards, it does linger a bit, and... And it, it's not unpleasant, it... Oh God, I was going to say it goes down a treat, but that's just making things worse. Rickfield's playtime. Stop, stop, <laughs> stop, 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 you bad, 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 bad man. This was stuff we fucking grew up with. Yes, I'm and going what to... else did we grow up with? Rick Field. Oh, God. Every time you say it, it gets worse. (laughs) And now here's Jack and Ori with Rick Field. Anyway, it does taste of something, which Mm. is a nice... But I am kind of with you on this. It's 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 nice, but it's a bit meh. Yeah. Would you pick it out of a lineup? No, not really. It's a three for me. I I don't... Do you know, that is a really odd gin to review because it does taste of something. It's certainly not a bland gin in any way, but... Simon's right. It, Unremarkable. It, yeah. And it shouldn't be because it's tasty. But I think it's another example of a gym that's had everything thrown at it and the result is less than the sum of its parts. Yeah, three out of five, I'm afraid. Sorry, Rick Feel. Stop. You're doing it deliberately now. It's not big and it's not clever. And it's above the law. Shall we... Distance ourselves from this conversation. <laughs> and get out our fingers. Oh, God. <laughs> Tonight we are starting off with finger bobs. Finger bobs. Finger bobs. Finger, finger bobs. <laughs> I love finger bobs. It was a massive part of my childhood. Well, there's well, finger, finger mouse, isn't there? Which was a bit later on that I'm more familiar with. But finger bobs, I know, started it all off. I they thought they were the same to thing. To finger mouse. Because each of the thingies in Finger Bobs, so Finger Mouse and the Scampi and the Tortoise and the Crow and the Seagull and all of these things had their own little songs. I can picture it as clear as day in my mind, I. Didn't Yaffe die reasonably recently, within the last few years? 
Don't spoil the magic for the children, I don't know. To give a bit of background to this, Finger Bobs, that was first made for the BBC. By... Q3, apparently. I don't know who Q3 are. And it was first broadcast on my birthday in 1972, 14th of February, as part of Watch With Mother. The show was created by Joanne and Michael Cole, who also created Bod. Michael Cole was actually one of the Vogons as well. Only 13 episodes were ever made, and were regularly repeated until December 1984. My Martis Yoffe, played by Canadian actor Rick Jones... Each 10-minute episode told a story centred on a paper finger puppet animal and usually involved collecting various items, such as pebbles or feathers, to make up another object at the end. The finger puppets, each of whom had their own song, included Finger Mouse, Gulliver, a seagull, Scampy, and Flash, a tortoise with a paper shell. Other characters included Enoch the Woodpecker, Scary the Crow, Louise the Squirrel, Prickly Friend the Hedgehog, and Gloria the White Mouse, <laughs> who appeared in the last edition as a girlfriend for Finger Mouse. Finger Mouse gained his own series in 1985. One series was made of 13 episodes. And Rick Jones, who was Yoffy, died in October 2021, age 84. So the episode we're going to watch today is Stones from the 21st of February 1972. It's time for Finger Bobs. Ron VT. One day, a big black crow was flying over the fields. He'd flown a long way, and he was feeling very thirsty. Could I do with a drink? Suddenly, he saw a jug on the ground, so he flew down to see if it had any water. It did, but it wasn't full, and the crow couldn't reach the water with his beak. (sighs) He tried everything. Just my luck. He started tipping the jug so the water would come higher, but it was very heavy. I might just upset this jug this way, he thought, and I'll lose all the water. I'll just have to think of another way. Hmm. Well, finger mouse. He's a sort of wonder mouse. They never have to think a mouse. And a blunder mouse. They're always on the brink of mouse. Poor thing. That's me. That was the second episode of Finger Bobs from 1972. And it was utterly charming. It was. And I thought that you would actually be massively twee about the whole thing and, and think that it was... Because we did Camberwick Green centuries ago. And, and ripped the piss out of it. Yeah, and you... Because it was wildly entertaining. I know, but you didn't seem overly charmed by it. You, you, I think I've always been more charmed by the small film stuff than you have. So I thought that you would be massively turned off by this, but in actual fact... Small films I find really charming. The Trumptonshire stuff, yeah. It's a bit twee and there's a creepy clown doll thing at the end. Oh, but it's beautifully sweet. It's fun, I enjoy it, but it's not as charming as... See, I've got to say I was more... Not creeped out, what was the word? I was more unsettled by the uh, Yoffy, the Canadian... Who looked like somebody from the 1970s. But guess what? He's somebody from the 1970s. He should have been presenting Open University. But he wasn't. The whole programme was utterly charming. And it was just so geared towards the imagination of children. Yeah, and it's get yourself a glove, get yourself a bit of paper. You've got entertainment. And you can do this yourself at home. I was going to say you can entertain yourself with your hand, but that's the wrong (laughs) thing to say. (laughs) Anyway, back to Rick Field, Jim. Put it away. <laughs> no, Sponsored it, by Finger Mouse. A finger of gin. Is just enough. To make your kids go green. It's full of Cadbury's bird muck. You don't know where it's been. Oh, God. <laughs> this is going to get us cancelled. <coughs> <coughs> that's the badness seeping out. Well, you may hang your head. Back to Finger Bob's which was utterly, utterly charming. Slightly creepy, the bit where he was fiddling about with somebody's great toe, but... But the basic premise of it is from a time that was more innocent. Absolutely encouraging people to use their own imagination. Yes. Yeah, this is a bit twee and shit, but look, you can do this stuff for yourself. It's like paper play. Yes. Have you seen paper play? Yeah, I have, yeah. It's in bitsy. Yes, and I love that. For all that we're supposed to make great advances... I honestly think that if you put this on CBeebies or something now, maybe a modernised version of it rather than, you know, done on film with the big hairy thing from Canada, I 
genuinely think that there's a place for that sort of thing for today's kids and it would do them good. Yeah, and it, what it would encourage them to do is go and do stuff after they've finished watching their telly programme. So they'd go and find a glove and pretend that it's a, a mouse or a snake or a monkey or whatever, as opposed to your yeah, pepper pigs and things that may be, may be very entertaining, but you watch one episode and all it encourages you to do is watch another episode. Yeah. I mean, I remember stuff like Button Moon. My nana had this big yellow puff thing. And it was this big circular puffet that was sort of a mustard yellow fabric with four buttons on it. And that was Button Moon. So I turned it on its side and I got a bean can and a sponge can and a funnel. And I made Mr. Spoon's space rocket because all the things that were in there were encouraging kiddies to see things in a different way, that it was a bean can, that all the characters were made out of wooden spoons and you could do this from stuff in your own kitchen. Yeah, and if you've got models that are too clever, there's no thought, do you know what, I could do that. It's just a, that looks great, let's watch the next one. But that was lovely. That was was really lovely. What a charming way to start the episode. And the, the particular episode we've just watched demonstrated Archimedes' principle. It was all about a crow filling up a jar with stones to be able to raise the water level enough to the point where it could drink. And I think that's an, isn't that an Aesop fable? As yes, well? it is, yeah. But it is a mark that that particular episode has stuck in the minds of, because I remember that was referenced in a League of Gentlemen episode. And I thought, I remember that from my childhood. Now, bear in mind, my childhood started six years after this was filmed. And I still remember it. But so it was still being shown through to the mid-80s. It was, but a measure of how good they are. And the stuff nowadays that is shown once and probably not repeated. Maybe I'm looking through a different prism. Maybe today's kiddies are looking at episodes of Peppa Pig or what have you, or Old Jack's Boat or Nick Pope's Popcast, which I know you won't have seen it. I, ha- clue. I have seen it, and it's the most unlikely man singing songs and telling stories. And it's wonderful stuff. So I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope in future they get the same nostalgia trip that we get out of stuff like this. Everything goes inside. Mm. But simplicity in story, in the realisation of storytelling will come and go in cycles, particularly in children's television. With that in mind, it's time to welcome our first guest. Hello. We are inviting friends of the podcast to join with us and chat through kiddies TV programs that they enjoy or remember, or in one case, kind of hate. Um, (laughs) But we'll come come on to that later. And the first of our friends that we've strong-armed into doing this is the lovely Cy Hart of Maximum Power Podcast fame. Hello, Cy. Hello. And Cy, what do you fancy talking about? Well, I thought I'd go back to my own childhood and one of the shows that I absolutely adored as a kid and um, have a look at Jamie and the Magic Torch. Oh, wonderful. I remember that from my childhood as well. Other than the fact that I remember Jamie Jamie being quite gormless, I don't really remember very much about it other than weird Technicolor and a dog called Wordsworth. My main memory is the opening titles, which were just the most exciting thing as a child, with the big Helter Skelter going down to Cuckoo Land and that brilliant glam rock theme. Just, yeah, there's nothing else quite like it, I think, at the time. I was always really excited when that was the ITV show at lunchtime. Now, having watched this, uh, I've realised I've not seen this since the early 80s. And that title sequence goes on for fucking ever. (laughs) They put a lot of effort into title sequences in those days, and they went on. And you got a good minute and a half there. But with anime, it's like the Bagpuss thing. The whole opening uh, section of Bagpuss is exactly the same episode to episode to episode because it's really cheap to do. Oh, yeah, way. it's all oh, very much. Yeah. You've got, you're filling a good two or three minutes worth of episode every time for free. Um, so we've watched the episode Hello Goodbye. Um, I'm actually really glad that you, you suggested this because it's one that I kind of have at the back of my mind, but it's not one that I would remember strongly enough to have thought of doing myself. And it was really nostalgic. 
yes, that's the thing. Is that it? It really took me back to being sort of three or four years old and watching these adventures. I and mean, it's not demanding storytelling, but they are always just fun, and the characters are bonkers, are brilliant, and weird, <laughs> absolutely bonkers. Yeah, there have been a number of kids TV programs in the in the past <laughs> where we've asked what people were smoking or snorting at the time that they were coming out with this. And I think nothing encapsulates that quite as well as the characters in Jamie the Magic Torch. It, Ludwig? Yeah, I, yeah, Ludwig was just weird, wasn't it? Uh, finger bobs. Oh, I don't know. There were there were little paper animals on fingers. No, there's a there's a logic to that. There's no bloody logic to Jamie and the Magic Torch. Um Looking at it now, and I didn't I didn't realise that at the time, it has a real yellow submarine feel to it. That is true, actually, yes. From Mr. Boo onwards with, with his submachine. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a definite definite reference there. So and sort of I think in the character design and the animation in some ways sort of echoes it all, doesn't it? Yeah, and that, that weird giant rabbit in the hat. Yeah. Could, you could sneak could him be in a, the background of Yeah, we well, could be a stand in for the blue submarine and he'd be there. I've just got this image in my head now of Brian Truman at three o'clock in the morning, spliffed off his tits, listening to Bob Dylan or something, scribbling down the ideas that are leaking out of his head. <sighs> Wordsworth should be West Country, that, yeah, that'll do. Jamie, It's completely mad. It's mental. You don't see it when you're a kid. And then watching it 40 years later, you realise just what visual crack you were smoking. And my recollection of Jamie being, being gormless, he really isn't the sharpest tool in the box. He's not, is he? Wordsworth is is the clever one here, as usual. No, oh, Jamie, are we going back to bed? Not yet, Wordsworth. We've still got seven minutes left. Jamie is very earnest and very, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> Did either of you, maybe this is just me and the whole Jamie connotation, but did either of you, were you reminded of Fraser Hines at all in the narration? That was the one thing that was all the way through, apart from the fact that it clearly isn't, but there's a very Fraser Hines-esque narration to it. Suddenly, Jamie saw something. Well, one moment it was there, next moment it wasn't. Or they looked at one another, wondering whether they'd really seen it at all. But there it was again, gone. Well, I hadn't thought of it. Yeah, uh, I, had, I hadn't either, and, and I would have to listen to mm. it again to. Yeah, it was a good choice, Sire, because I have that. That was a slice of childhood that I'd I'd locked away in a cupboard. There's other things, you know. Every now and again, something will crop up, like the Flumps or Pigeon Street or something. That's my mm-hmm. whole sort of era, you know, mosh chops. But it was all all the. It was, this was an ITV thing, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah. This was an ITV lunchtime show, so you'd get this and um, Rainbow and Pipkins and things yeah. like that, just in the lunchtime slot. This was always the one that I was most excited about when it turned up in that slot as a kid. I just loved it to bits and then sort of forgot about it, except for the theme. And going back and watching it now, you're right. It's incredibly weird and incredibly strange. But I think that sort of makes it stand up a bit better, maybe, than than some of the other more earnest things. Because you just get involved in this world and meet these strange characters and you're, you're dragged along with Jamie and his adventures. Different look, but it kind of had a bit of a feel of Chalton and the Wheelies about it in terms of the the weirdness. Well, I'm fairly sure Brian Truman had a hand in that. He was, uh, I think... Even, yeah, yeah, it's the same production team, yeah. isn't it, I think? That, again, it's, it's that whole same stable, even though this is animation rather than stop motion. But the 80s, really, and uh, it's a crowbar in a lot of the 70s as well, really, but they were the golden age of the TV theme tune. But this was a 70s thing rather than an 80s thing, wasn't it? Yeah, no, but it leaked through into the 80s. There was some cracking... I don't even want... I want to just confine it to kids' TV. But there were some cracking themes in the 80s. And once you sneak into the 90s, they all go a bit thin. And now, programmes don't even have theme tunes at all. Yeah, we, we were ruined back then. Because all the classic theme tunes... Sorry, to put this into context, I've uh, hosted quiz nights for 20 years. Yeah. Every week I do an audio round. And I used to, in the you know for a good 10, 15 years, I used to do TV themes as, a, as one of the audio rounds. You can't do it now. Because TV, even something like that's really popular, like Stranger Things, the Stranger Things theme is really, really generic, repetitive, 
uninspired, even though millions of people watch that. It's not something that's in the public consciousness in the way that they were when we only had four channels to go at. The thing that really no, shows... and everyone skips Sorry. the intros, don't they? So no one pays attention to title sequences and theme musics in the way that they used to. Mm. And the thing that really shows that is the Star Trek themes over the years, because they have gradually got duller and duller and duller. So you, you have the original series, 1960s, absolutely iconic theme tune and then you have your next generation which is very good by the time you get into voyager it's kind of a snooze fest what i did like on that score when we had because the discovery theme i do quite like and there's nice little homages in there to past themes yeah the picard theme i can't remember the theme in my head but there are lovely little musical nods to the past and it speaks volumes that the musical nods to the past are where you get the tingle rather than the theme tune itself. I mean, listen to some of the greats that we had when we were kids. Even just going through kiddies TV themes, Chalton and the Wheelies was a banger. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's, it's beyond Simon's time, but stuff like Thomas the Tank Engine is a theme that even adults know that one. Thundercats and... Horror oh, people. UFO, it is, it's Space amazing. 1999. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Both of them for Space 1999. I've done DJing for uh, a couple of conventions. I've got a rip of Power Themes 9. <laughs> <laughs> and the UFO theme was what got people on the dance floor. They yeah, it's unexpected, themes. isn't it? It's so funky. UFO and Space 1999, particularly the first year, is absolutely brilliant. The Avengers, the second Avengers theme, is superb. Tomorrow People, mm-hmm. one of the best theme tunes ever ever made. Mission Impossible, the original Star Trek. Actually, The Man from Uncle is pretty good as well. Yeah, but, the fact that you can hum all of those, hmm. but you can't hum anything that you've been watching recently from recent TV sort of says a lot, doesn't it? Yes. Apart uh, from Doctor Who. Doctor Who's the one that is maintaining a good and engaging theme tune and credit sequence because it's kind of historically expected. The theme and the, me- the melody and the, the bass are, they are 60 years old, they've just been rearranged, and the current iteration of the Doctor Who theme with Jodie Whittaker is marvellous. Yeah, it's about the oh, best so thing good, about it. it. Yeah, so good. It is. I'm really going to miss that when Russell T Davis comes back. Although he has got a history of, uh, he appreciates what makes Doctor Who Doctor Who. So I live in hope that it will be good. Yes. We've drifted a little way, and it's telling that we've spent more time <laughs> talking about theme music than we have about the actual meat and potatoes of the episode of Jamie and the Magic Torch. But, but the theme music was marvellous. It was, um, but I've said this before. It's uh, it's no surprise to me that my generation have turned out a little bit odd, uh, looking back on the yeah, stuff that we, we were spoon we were fed. trained, weren't we? <laughs> I really like the title. I really like the melancholy start with the street at night and the music is slightly unsettling and sad before you get this big rousing theme, which is is really lovely. And I really like the fact that you don't see Jamie's mum ever. You just see her in shadow the whole time. That's and almost, it's about Jamie's adventures. It's almost Wizard of Oz-ish where it goes from yeah. black and white to colour. It goes from sort of staid and a bit drab to turn on the magic torch, go down the, the Helter Skelter, and suddenly Technicolor and everything. everybody and everything is weird. And that bit kind of said Wizard of Oz to me. The final thing I'd like to say is that I wonder when Jamie catches up on his sleep if he's in cuckoo land every night. Maybe that's why he's as good well, as he is. Well, it does seem that he's, he's only in Cuckoo tiredness. Land for about 10 minutes. The adventures seem to happen in real time. <laughs> so he's not there for very long. <laughs> it's not like there's huge langers where he's um, off doing other things. He's literally there, has the adventure, and then Wordsworth says, right, come on, we're off. Yeah, and the Cuckoo Landers are probably saying, oh, God, it's him again. Things are good. <laughs> <laughs> things are going to bugger up and then they'll sort themselves out and then we can get back to our lives yeah and we've got 24 hours before we'll be back it's fine <laughs> yeah and the policeman really reminded me of the you know those wheelie things in the return to oz film yeah um, i was yeah. waiting for oh, one yes. of you to say that mm-hmm. yeah and i don't know if it's just me but the handyman really looks like frank skinner <laughs> yes oh he does <laughs> yes <laughs> and the professor looks like clive doig yes mm-hmm. he does God, we're drifting to Jigsaw and, uh, well, Frank Skinner's not done it. Vision On, I loved, oh. I loved Vision On when I was a kid. Absolutely loved it. 
It's telling that of all the stuff that we do, kiddies, TV, that's the one where we ramble for England. I sent loads of pictures into Vision on and none of them made them onto the gallery. I mean, I cannot draw for Toffee and they would all have been utterly shite. But I, was, I always watched the gallery intensely, wondering if something that I'd drawn would end up on there. And it never did. I remember sending in a, a picture of a cow being milked to take heart. It wasn't in the gallery. I was gutted. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Tony Hart. Put a lot of effort into that cow. <laughs> he never oh. put my pictures up on take heart either, so <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> Sai, so, thank you so much for suggesting that. That was a lovely little slice of nostalgia. We've loved it. It's yes. been a pleasure. A pleasure as always. Um, can you just remind people where they can find you? Yep. You can track me down on episodes of Maximum Power, the Blake 7 podcast, along with many episodes of A Hamster with a Blunt Pen Knife, which is a Doctor Who commentary podcast. And both are incredibly entertaining and very well worth listening to. For this next section, we are joined by Alan Fogg. Welcome aboard, mate. Now, what you. have you selected for our kids' marathon? Chalton and the Weenies. Jump in, we'll take you for a spin and show you round the wheelie world. Hop on, it's fun to come along and take a look at wheelie world. And the episode we're going to watch is Chalton Gets His Wheels. Ron VT. Nothing seemed to happen, but then that's magic for you. Anyway, Fenella was happy enough, and with a quick look round to make sure she'd not been spotted, she popped back to the kettle. <coughs> Unfortunately, she was laughing too soon. The spell she'd cast on the cart wouldn't stop it moving. It would make it the fastest thing in the wheelie world. Charlton arrived for his lesson in style. He beamed at Zuma and Jenny, all goggles and giggles. Oh, said Zuma. Now, before we start, here. There was a flash of blurred spots, and Chawton zoomed round the village just this side the speed of sound. Stop someone! <laughs> well, gents, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's no surprise that my generation is a bit odd. Something about the 60s and LSD was all I could take from that. They were definitely smoking, drinking, and inhalating. I mean, Chalton the Wheelie is, is weird as fuck anyway. I'm trying to find a, a polite way to describe Chalton and... You're not succeeding. So spit it out. He's an arsehole. He really is. He stomps around, kind of fucking everything up. Brain of a flea. Is he the one that starts off the whole I don't have any wheels thing? No. The wheelies do it for him. Yes. Because the episode opens with the wheelies are having their annual polishing day where they're all... Buffing each other. Yes. Shining their own axles and things. And somebody decides that the Minister of... What is it? Wheel Estate. The Minister... <laughs> decides that Chalton needs his own wheel, so they get him a sort of skateboard thing. I mean, that's quite nice, because they've obviously realised that Chalton's a bit special. They're treating him as disabled and making adaptations for him, which is lovely. It's inclusive in Wheelie World. Yes. See, a lot of the dialogue, and, and we've found this with a few things recently, a lot of the dialogue isn't dialogue at all. It's just giggling and gurning and making strange noises for extended periods. But didn't they carry that on with Tinky Winky and La La's and all that crap? Yeah. I don't know what the hell that was. That's beyond my time, but I've heard parents having to suffer going through that where they just talk mumbo-jumbo crap. Yeah. Well, that's the Teletubbies, and it was literally talking oh, was crap yeah. because all four of them were named after Kitty's descriptions of going for a shite. Oh. Yeah. Tinky Winky and Poe and all of that was, I need a crap. Oh, okay. Not the relief after you've had a big crap, but yes, before. Yes, got it. Not certain that babies are that nuanced in their description. Mm. Yeah, Teletubbies annoyed the fuck out of me. Yeah, thankfully we're not doing that for this episode, because it annoyed the fuck out of me as well when I've seen it. It just looked mental. But it's difficult to call it when we grow up on stuff like this. Joe Lynch does all the narration for this. I don't know who Joe Lynch is. No, well, I, I think he's one of the, uh, what do you call it? Animation. Acid casualties? Joe <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say it as well. The animation studio. Crossgrove Hall. Thank you. I think he was one of the staples. But, of course, you never think about it when you're a kid, but he did all the voices. Mm. He must have been absolutely exhausted after every episode, because they're 10 minutes long, and the range of voices that that man has to do, and they're all completely insane. Fenella the Kettle Witch. In Welsh. In dreadful Cod Welsh. Cod Welsh, verging towards Delhi. And then there's Chalton himself. 
Uh, it was supposed to be from Cholton cum Hardy. Oh. Yes. It's on the inside of his egg, apparently, when he's born. Oh. Or maybe it was just an instruction from his dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's an experience. We watched it. I'd forgotten how crap it was. I wouldn't want to see many more episodes unless I drunk a lot of my alcohol. But we do this a lot, though. Or, or I've done it in, a lot in the past, where when things started being released in series on VHS, mm. I'd buy them or you know on Blu-ray or on DVD they'd come out. And you think, God, I used to love that. Yeah, I'd love the whole series. And then you watch one and you've seen them all. Yeah, that's, it, that's uh, yeah, yeah, one's enough. Yes, yep. Yeah, I mean, bag push that whole bringing crap back to the shop <laughs> and, and everybody waking up and everything. It's half the episode and it's exactly the same every single time. Yeah, oh, the mice and the organs. Yes, <laughs> that sounded wrong, didn't it? Yes, <laughs> the, the marvelous mechanical mouse organ. Yes, that was it. You see, I used to love Chorlton and the Wheelies when I was a kid, and Ferdus, the theme tune, banging. Would fill the dance floor, I, I suspect, with men of my age or women of my age. Children. You sound older than us. Children of my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it would. This is, well, it's a bit uh, bad now, but Paul and I used to uh, end up being washed up at this nightclub in Morecambe called the Carlton. Mm. And they used to fill the dance floor with the Jim will fix it theme tune. Ooh. Probably wouldn't get away Ooh, with that God now. No, no. Yeah. No. Scooby Doo was the one that I used to use. What, to clear the dance floor? No, to get people onto the really? dance floor, yeah. Really? Yeah. It was a goth club. Yes, we have done goth for your 50th down in Birmingham with sticky floors and gin shots. It was an experience, I remember. Oh, the gin shots were a nightmare. Uh, it's my <laughs> wonderful but horribly misguided friend, Nathan. It was the same pub that we went to for the wedding. Yeah. And we'd been there for my 50th, and then a small group of, well, the desperate, really, went on to this really skanky goth club. And Nathan decided he was going to buy me gin shots. So he bought about 30 gin shots. Of the most god-awful gin. It's and none of these other the bastards right would help out. No, his heart was in the right place. It's such a lovely touch, but the gin was... Uh, yeah, had intriguing. he actually asked beforehand, then there are things that we could have shotted, but very cheap gin, no. Oh, proper gut rot then. Which presumably is what they were drinking before they wrote Chawton and the Wheelies. No, they were inhalating various things. Because this, I think this I was don't know late... what you do with LSD and how you take LSD, but judging by the graphics and the complete weirdness of it, they were definitely taking whatever they could, whenever they could, however they could, up wherever they could. Well, think about the kiddies' programs in the seventies. Mm. I'll sort of point towards the seventies primarily. Everyone involved in those must have been suffering from some sort of PTSD. Mm. Because you've got things like Jamie and the Magic Torch. Oh, it's just bonkers. <laughs> the Magic Roundabout. Finger mm, bobs. Somebody, oh, finger bobs. Good God, that's another one as well, yes. Morph is another one that I haven't seen for a very long time. I'll have to do a bit of Morph. Morph was a little bit later. I mean, Morph, Morph was originally part Tony of... Tony Hart. Was yeah, Take Hart. Yeah. Uh, it might even have been Vision on. It was originally part of Take That. But <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he left when he got it's, too big. It just <laughs> went solo with Chaz. Um, Dave. <laughs> Morph and Chaz and Dave. Now those are banned. Morph's guest slot with the Wurzels. <laughs> Came out with a little straw sticking out of his blast to sing. <laughs> Three gallon a day cider habit. <laughs> yeah. A bit like Windy Miller. Oh, was, Windy Miller, oh, yes. On the subject that, of what, cider habit. Yeah. What, what, uh, what was Windy Miller in? Windy Miller was in Camberwick Green. Oh, yes. And in his episode, within the first five minutes, he was utterly wrecked on yeah. cider. Yes. Properly pissed. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've all been there. In a kid's program. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like Postman Pat suddenly mm. developing a 60 a day habit. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember being my aunt's and uncle's farm at about the age of 11, 12 when we were doing bathing, hauling, and having my uncle's scrumpy. I don't remember much else. It's quite lethal stuff, it's scrumpy. But anyway, oh, it's digress. good stuff, it's proper farm. Yeah, yeah proper, oh. proper pint of scrump. Yeah. yeah. And you need one. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so we've not talked about Chorlton and the Wheelies, but it is fucking mental. And the, the background design. <laughs> Was it a bit dildonic? A bit phallic. Um, there, there were some that were, and there were some that looked like black-painted chumblies. Yes, they did. After you'd pointed them out, because I've never really spotted them before, I did wonder whether they were supposed to be nuts and bolts and cogs and things and spanners. Well, certainly those hexagonal things mm. are bolts because they've got an internal screw. Now, whether that's just because they happen to have some spare bolts hanging around the design office, 
But it, it's definitely what they were. And the palace was a motorbike helmet. Yes. With a crown stapled onto the top of it. I never noticed all these things when I was a kid, but yeah, they are. So another slice of childhood tainted. I won't say ruined, but tainted. How old do you get? I'm 45 at the minute, oh. and... So yeah. mid range, he's senior citizen. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of halfway there. Yeah, if I'm yeah. lucky, mm-hmm. I don't expect to finish the other half of this lap. <laughs> <laughs> Ninety, I think I'll be very lucky. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was early eighties. That mm. was my kid. Okay, so I was chalking on the wheelies and mosh chops and yeah. Thomas the Tank Engine, Rainbow, Pigeon Street. I don't mean Pigeon Street. I mean, I'm late 70s, early 80s, because I've got the big 5 0 this year. But yes, yeah, so you were five years down the line. Yeah, by yeah, then. yeah, five years more advanced, but yes. Into the crap stuff was coming down your way, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whereas I was Chauntland and the Wheelies and Jamie and the Magic Torch and Teddy Jamie Edward Torch, and... Yeah, yeah. Um, Crystal Tips and Alistair. What the fuck were they smoking when they were all that? No, that was about 10 years earlier. Crystal Tips and Alistair is 60s. Is it? Yeah. I've always thought it was was coated with crystal meth or something like that. No. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Those kids. (laughs) (laughs) Crystal Tips and Mary Mungo and Midge and... Clopper Castle and... um, That was a lot later. The Herbs. Past of the Lion. Clarence. Flumps. Oh, Flumps was awesome. Bod. Bod, oh no. Bod, I I don't remember Flumps. With that bloody frog in his milkshakes. Tales of the Riverbank. Riverbank Custard? Which one's that? Uh-huh. It was something drawn by an animator off his face. Mm. It was very loosely drawn, let's put yeah. it that was way. It a green dog and a pink cat. Ah. Not like the rhubarb and custards we get from Tesco's, no. which don't tend to last more than five minutes when they get to the car. But yes. Okay. Have we varied enough off topic, gentlemen? I think Just we a have. little bit. Well, Alan, thank you for joining us for this segment. It's Pleasure. Been... Thank you for having yes. me again. <laughs> Everything you say sounds smutty. You can't help it. But yes, uh, we hope to have you on again soon. I look forward to it. Thank you. We'll show you all the sights of Wheelie World. Well, for our next segment, we are joined by Paul Isles Rush. Welcome back, mate. Hello. Hello. Um, what have you chosen for us to watch tonight? Count Ducula. In the heart of Transylvania, in the vampire hall. <laughs> well, we have been presented with Return of the Curse of the Secret of the Mummy's Tomb meets Frank and Duckula's Monster and a Talking Cabbage. It's the 17th episode of Series 2. It was broadcast on January the 9th, 1990. And the plot of this thing, which I'm ripping from countducula.fandom.com, Count Ducula is chased by an alien cabbage, a werewolf, a mummy, Frank and Ducula's monster, Dr. Von Goosewing, and some angry villagers. He flies Castle Ducula away from Transylvania to escape his pursuers to an island near Scotland, the English bastard, and he gets eaten by monsters for breakfast. Mr. Igor, just look at the state of you. What have you been up to, I should like to know? Oh, it would appear that I have made a somewhat serious error of judgment, Nanny. Yes? What's that mean, Mr. Igor? You remember the young master's great, great, great uncle, Dr. Franken Duckula? Yes. Er, um, no. And you remember that he created a... Monster! That's right, Help! Nanny, and I... Help! Help! Help, Igor, Nanny, do something! Very good, my lord. <laughs> You thought of a plan, Igor? Yes, Listen, what are you going to do? Run like blazes, my lord. It was implied he was eaten by monsters for breakfast. <laughs> and I'm not sure it was implied it was Scotland, because it did look a little bit tropical. Yeah. Well, you and I were brought up with this, Paul. Yes. And I loved it as a kid, and I didn't realise they were 20-odd <laughs> minutes long. No, and it, it definitely... Felt like 20 years <laughs> old. <laughs> it certainly did. And I can't say that I enjoyed it as much as I did when I was a kid. Dr. Exton, what's your background with Docula? Well, there was an amount of padding. <laughs> an amount. <laughs> Which is quite an achievement for a, an episode that features so many, <laughs> so many buddies. I mean, I didn't watch it first time around. I've seen it sort of off and on. 
often when I've been here and it's been towards the end of a slightly ginny evening and I've rejected the idea of watching Thomas the Tank Engine. So, Well, the last time I showed you one of those, he got walled up. <laughs> yes. But I'll never forget your reaction at the end of that one. <laughs> Well, it was a little bit Edgar Allan Poe. But we're not talking about tedious Thomas. You're on ultra thin ice. <laughs> Moving on. Count Docula, I the thing I really remembered about it was the theme tune. Yeah. The theme tune's awesome, and Cosgrove Hall were very good at theme tunes. Children and the Wheelies, alias the Jester. Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse, of course. How could I, I was scrabbling for that one. <laughs> but they just know how to do theme tunes. Animation-wise, they were gods of their own church in the 1970s and 80s. They're just the only animators to go to in Britain, really. And they're very good at it, but this episode, I'm afraid, I'd not actually thought of it in those terms yet. How can you pad out something that's got about 10 baddies in it? <laughs> uh, but they, they manage it. It was Half of it was David Jason audio gurning, really, <laughs> just making various laughing noises and padding the thing out. I can't say I really enjoyed this. It was there. It was entertaining vaguely, but the nostalgia factor is the only thing that kept me going through that. Mm. And Count Duckula, at several points throughout that episode, made reference to the fact that the only joke that they've got is that Nanny breaks everything. And like every, every scene, he's like, oh, come on, Nanny, what are you going to break now? Oh, there she goes, breaking something again. But th- that was the only joke throughout the whole run of the series, and they definitely didn't underuse it in this one. <laughs> I've got to say that Nanny's my favourite character. <laughs> uh, Nanny, then Igor, then Duculus the Ducula, I found a, a bit of an... He would have found his way into the oven as a roast <laughs> a long time ago. Well, a small roast. <laughs> I'm not averse to a bit of dog. But Jack May as Igor, who's got the wonderful deep voice, the one that is another voice like Valentine Dial, 80 a day for 50 years. <laughs> and then whoever's doing Nanny, and I can't remember who's doing Nanny, but she was always the best character, even even the title sequence. <laughs> you see, I, I like Igor. Oh, yes. Mm. The thing I did like in this was the hammer horror local yokels in the village town. <laughs> oh. Deciding to become a, an angry mob. <laughs> an angry mob of hens. I did, I'd forgotten that they're all based on birds. Yeah. Well, we had this with Trapdoor when we watched an episode of that. The secondary characters are more interesting than the primary character. But except Trapdoor is only 10 minutes. True, true. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a common thing that I found when we watch stuff like this. You know, when you, you watch something back from your childhood and you think, I used to love this, put it on, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 10 minutes in, you think... Yeah, I've seen enough. Mm. And this is one of them. Whereas I used to lap this up with, you know, I remember sitting in front of this thing, eating potato waffles and beans. <laughs> Very fond memories from my childhood, but I, no, I wasn't gripped by this. In fact, I was wondering when the bloody thing was going to end. It should have been 10, 15 minutes. Mm. Yeah. Even then, <laughs> this episode might have been a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten the castle could time travel, though, or, or yeah. certainly teleport. Yeah. Because it was only when I heard that noise that it all came flooding back. And it, it was a, a leap into the coffin, and then the coffin lit up with stage lights. <laughs> it was very odd. You paper over a lot of cracks when you're a kid. You accept things being nonsensical and, frankly, a bit shit. Cause ah, Ludwig. <laughs> let's not wander back into Ludwig territory. That's the product of a... Check. Television Mind. producer writing and animating something while high as a kite on space cake. I don't think they were allowed to do that in Czechoslovakia in the 70s. Whether they're allowed to or whether they do are two different matters. Ludwig, a crystal egg with a telescope and a deer stalker hat. <laughs> That's fucking mental. It's saying quite a lot about Count Duckula that we've been talking a lot about Ludwig and the trapdoor and all sorts of other things because there wasn't really an awful lot to talk about. Mm. This should have worked. Cosgrove Hall, excellent theme tune. David David Jason. Jason. This should work. It's it's too long. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is, yeah. Because it's it's quite a a funny concept, isn't it, like that? Well, like a vampire, a vampire duck, duck and a vegetarian vampire duck. The- because in the resurrection ceremony, they used a bottle of tomato ketchup <laughs> instead of a bottle of blood. That, I mean, it just didn't, it wasn't as good as I remember. No. I'm, I'm was Igor always that inept? No, I, 
My I impression don't is with that he was the competent one. Yeah. And that it was Nanny that kind of fucked up his plans to turn, <laughs> mm. to turn Ducula into something evil. And in this episode, he was the one who started it with his own stupidity by releasing the monster because he said something like, oh, I wonder if I may have done something. <laughs> and then, and it, well, but Nanny on, came up with the He turned on the plan. power switch in, yeah, the, in, the, in the laboratory. In the yeah. Frank and Duck laboratory. <laughs> But it was Nanny's idea. Was it always Nanny's idea that saved the day at the end? <sighs> she gave the idea for them to disappear the castle. And Ducula tells her to shut up. I don't remember it being that. Exactly I actually remember uh, it being a, a Ducula's sort of serendipity that got them out of things mm. a, lot of, a lot of the time, rather than any actual nous. But I always remember Igor being the one who was, the, in effect, the brains of the operation. But cursed with terrible luck. <laughs> maybe we, just, uh, maybe I <laughs> just picked a dud episode. I only picked it because it had a funny, a title. ridiculous <laughs> title. Yes, it does remind me of ectoplasm because that had a similar no uh, because that had a similar sort of thing. Uh, a oh dear, I've profaned his eardrums with a comparison he doesn't like. Ectoplasm continue. Is, <laughs> ectoplasm <laughs> is a radio series that we covered for our other podcast, the Archive of Audio Antiquities. And it's brilliant, it, which this wasn't. It's very good, but it brilliant has is the, word the inept protagonist and a fairly inept housekeeper sort of thing. And then there's, who's the doctor in it? Dr. Lilac. Yes, who is the brains of the operation. <laughs> well, no, because the ectoplasm, there are really two brains of the operation, because there's the scientific brains, which is Dr. Lilac, but he doesn't have any common sense. And then there's the one who sort of kind of, in control and knows exactly what's going on and is sarcastic as hell, which is Theremin, the butler. Oh, yes. I am conflating two characters. Uh, Exoplasm, worth checking out. Brackets, see other podcast. <laughs> um, so, uh, bottom line, I don't think any of us are going to be racing to recommend this to the boys and girls, are we? Well, not it was never nostalgic not. for me, so... And you've not sold it to me with that episode. <laughs> Cheers, Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so to round us off, what have we watched, Dr. Exton? We have watched the second episode of Lassie's Rescue Rangers. Now, I remember Lassie's Rescue Rangers uh, from when I was a kid in the 70s, and I remember really enjoying it. <laughs> it's the story of, well, the film character Lassie, and uh, they go way, way beyond they ever did in, in the films in terms of the, what's that, Lassie? There's somebody <laughs> trapped down the, down the well. Because Lassie also has a whole load of other <coughs> rescue animals that she works with. There's an owl and a mountain lion and a skunk and a raccoon and a porcupine and a tortoise. And, the, and there's a whole rescue station that she's based around with a, a husband and wife who run the station, which is Ben and Laura, somebody or other. Turner. Ben and Laura Turner and their son. And there's also a, a younger daughter and a much younger son who is blind. Uh, Susan, Jackie and Ben Jr. And there is a, a Native American lad who helps them out as well, Gene Fox. It was actually episode three that we watched from September the 22nd, 1973, called Mystic Monster. And the synopsis reads, something has crash-landed in the woods. Could it be a visitor from outer space? Rescue base to rescue rangers. Do you read me? What is it, Ben? I'm worried about Mom. She just saw something outside and went to take a look. What was it she saw? Same thing Susan saw. It ran into the barn. Oh, no! Ben? Call your mother into the house and lock the doors. We'll be there as soon as we can. Roger, Dad. Dad, send Lassie on ahead. She'll make better time than we will. Good idea, Susan. Lassie, go home. <coughs> okay, what are you waiting for? Get moving. And it, it ends up that it kind of is. So, somewhat oddly, the two youngest children of the Turners, which is the young son and the daughter, share a bedroom together. A little bit odd. Not for the time. Yeah, but if there was a choice between the two boys sharing a bedroom together and one of the girls and the younger boy sharing a bedroom together... It's probably just the two youngest kids in a room. For the time, that doesn't strike me as very odd. That girl has boobs. She's not that young a kid. You notice more than I did. God almighty. Thanks. 
and has a headband that is apparently nailed to her head because she doesn't take it off when she goes to bed or anything. What is this gin called? Rick Feel. Put it away. <laughs> You're not funny and you'll get us cancelled. <clears throat> um, so yeah, they're, they're two youngest kids reading science fiction together after lights have gone out and they see this weird light glowy in the sky, shooting star, crash lands, they go out to investigate. Glowy bloke who is clearly going to turn out to be somebody in a suit a la Scooby-Doo. It's very Scooby-Doo, isn't it? It is. They're obviously trying to be diverse and inclusional and multicultural. So there's a, a Native American character and the only one of the team that gets to do action adventure rescue stuff is Laura. Ben goes off wandering around with, with the kids and sort of investigates stuff. Whereas when the the glowy alien thing turns up at, at rescue centre and nicks their helicopter, she leaps onto the skids and is there up in the air, climbing herself into the, the helicopter, ready to do battle with this glowy monster. Now, it turns out that the glowy monster is a crashed cosmonaut who is just trying to rescue his fellow cosmonaut who's unconscious and on a precarious and overbalancing ledge. So the rescue team get themselves to this ledge. Ben tries to go and rescue the cosmonaut, but he's too heavy and he starts overweighting the little ledge thing. So he comes off the ledge. Lassie goes in and face licks the bloke into into consciousness, which apparently Ben didn't think of. So, I mean... Swings and roundabouts. The collie's got it right. Yes. But the helicopter's up above. I mean, the downdraft from the helicopter probably isn't helping with the stability of the ledge. <laughs> But they've got a dangly thing that the now awake cosmonaut can grab hold of, grab hold of Lassie and get swung to safety. And it all finishes off with somebody from Russian space headquarters or whatever saying... Thank you, uh, Americans. It's very good of you to, to help us. Yeah. And for the absolute coldest part of the Cold War, which 1973 would have been, to have a sort of sympathetic collaboration between Russians and Americans would have been quite a... I appreciate the sweetness of it and the, the uh, um, so because the best way of changing society in any way is through kids. Yeah. And the thing that you don't see with this is there was always a little snippet of sort of forest lore afterwards where one of the rescue ranger characters would sit down and talk you through a little bit of what happens in forest. So Paul and I for a previous attempt at recording on this <laughs> and it was quite late late in the evening and we were we were a little tired and you'd already gone and gone and crashed. We watched a different episode. And we did comment on it, but the comments are fairly unintelligible. The little snippet at the end was all about poison oak and poison ivy. So it, it was sort of wilderness craft. And actually in that one, the one who does all the helicopter flying and everything is, again, Laura rather than Ben. Ben doesn't appear in the first episode at all. See, Mask used to be like that. You probably, Again, you're probably not aware of Mask, but it was a, a 1980s... Cars, action cars. I mean, it was very good, actually, but that always used to end with a little one, two minute safety vignette. Don't play with boiling chip pans, that sort of thing. I have a very nostalgic soft spot for Lassie's Rescue Rangers. Watching it again, okay, we can take the piss out of it and we can laugh at how Blokey gets sidelined and everything, but. It is entertaining. I, yes, I, I'll give you that. I was entertained by it in a way that a lot of early 70s cartoons have become really quite dated. Okay, the costuming is dated, the insistence on the blind character being front and centre. But under other circumstances, that could work. If they had, and I don't know if they ever did this, but if they had an episode where they were trapped underground without any light, then the blind character would become the most important trail finder and, and things. They may have come on and done that because there does seem to have been an awful lot of conscious thought going to, we're going to give the action sequence to the, the female character rather than the male character. We're going to have a Native American character. We're going to have a, a front and centre female protagonist. We're going to have a front and centre disabled protagonist. So there does seem to be that very inclusional voice, which isn't unusual now, but really was in 1973. So for all it's a daft little kids cartoon, it's a daft little kids cartoon with a lot of heart behind it and a lot of forward thinking. I really like that. I'm going to actually agree with you for once that, yes, I can see where it was trying to go. I was never a fan of Lassie. I don't like any of the 
animal stuff. So Flipper never really appealed to me. Gentle Ben, that sort of thing. Lassie, none of them ever really. Uh, Skippy, none of that. The reception to this, actually, just from reading the Oracle, the 16 episode season was not well received. Lassie's trainer, Rudd Weatherwax, what a name, said, that's not Lassie, that's trash. The National Association of Broadcasters agreed. The manufacturers of this rubbish have incorporated violence, crime and stupidity in what is probably the worst show for children of the season. Bollocks. (laughs) I think this kind of inclusivity is exactly what kids should see. And, you know, this isn't aimed at the Teletubby market. This is probably your 8 to 12 year old. Yeah. And there should be an element of life can be a little bit shit at times, so keep an eye out for it. I don't see a problem with the whole mystery-solving musician genre, hark back to drawing together there, um, (laughs) solving crimes. I mean, it's what Scooby-Doo did. For years and still does. Yeah, that bit of it I don't see a problem with. The inclusivity, I think, is great. It's very ahead of its time. I can't even say it's flawed because... The cast, you've got your core family, and unless you were going to make one of the parents non-white, then you've got your your father, your mother, the three children, one of whom is disabled. You've got a front and centre assistant who is a person of colour and Native American. I, I was going to say for the 1970s, no, I think for any time period, that is a proactive and inclusive cast. You're quite keen on this, aren't you? I am. I've got a real nostalgic soft spot for this from when I watched it as a kid. And I was kind of expecting to watch it and get a bit bored by it and take the piss out of it a bit. And I wasn't. I was entertained for the 15 minutes that it was on the screen. I thought it was an entertaining storyline. I mean, it's very linear. It's very predictable. It's very, very clear from the moment it starts that it's going to end up being a bloke in a suit. (laughs) I really, really didn't expect it to be a Russian bloke in a suit. I expected it to be a, oh, thank you for helping our brain. American Spaceman. I didn't really expect it as a sort of hands across space thing. And I thought that worked really well. Yeah, I'm really keen on this. I'm glad. I am glad that we've rounded off with something that... I mean, I did enjoy that, don't get me wrong. It's, I, it doesn't hold the same connection for me that it does for you, but I'm glad that we've rounded off with something that you genuinely really enjoyed because it's easy when we look back at these kiddies things to look through, we'll put this on for nostalgia and actually we're cruelly disappointed when it's actually played. But this time you do seem to have enjoyed it. I'm de- I am delighted for you. And actually this episode, I don't think we've come across anything that is terrible or hasn't stood the test of time. Docular. It's not held up well. Oh, good point. Not held up well. But on that note, boys and girls, we shall sign off. Uh, thank you very much for listening to all of us. Thank you to our contributors, because it's been a pleasure, as always, to have you on board. It's been an absolute joy to have everybody on board with this. There will be a volume three. There will. Because we, we can't resist this sort of stuff. And, uh, and it, oh, there is so much to tap into here. Thank you to you for listening. Thank you for being you. Oh, thank you. Are you all right? <laughs> no, well, let's not go down that road. Thank you all. We will be back next time with something equally joyous. Ta ta. Bye, bye. Good night, children everywhere. The Exton Moss Experiment featured Simon Exton and Ken Moss. All featured soundtracks are the property of their respective producers, and no infringement of copyright is intended. Title music was performed by the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the programme was produced by Maverick Productions. For more information, please visit maverickproductionsuk.blogspot.com or find us on social media.